Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Savitt, and happy to welcome you back to the Center for Security Policy for our fall webinar series. To check our schedule, go to securefreedom.org and check under the webinar tab. I'll also give you a preview of upcoming events after today's broadcast. Today's program is entitled Securing the Border in the Biden Era with our guest, Congressman Chip Roy of Texas, and my center colleague, Kyle Scheidler, will be moderating. Please note that you are in listen-only mode. You can submit your text questions in the Q&A box in your GoToWebinar panel. I will read as many questions as possible at the end of the program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom, and on our website at securefreedom.org. With that, I'll pass it to the Center's Director and Senior Analyst for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, Kyle Scheidler. Thank you, Adam. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity today to bring you Congressman uh, Chip Roy, who has really been a lion uh, in the Congress when it comes to addressing the challenges on the southern border uh, that we have seen. Since the beginning of the Biden administration, we have seen a meteoric rise in illegal crossings on the southern border, reaching an unprecedented 200,000 illegals crossing in July, and that number is uh, expected to continue to rise. The Biden administration has aggressively sought to terminate successful border policies, including the migrant protection protocols, which are better known as the remain in Mexico policy, and that's despite a federal court order. This administration has deliberately hampered U.S. Border Patrol, forcing them to serve as little more than processing assembly requ uh, asylum requests, and has engaged in shuttling migrants around the country by bus and plane, sometimes in the dead of night, uh, as a recent New York Post article reported. And to help us get a handle on this, uh, we, we asked Congressman Chip Roy to come on and talk to us today. Congressman Roy is a devoted father and husband of two, or <laughs> husband and father of two, currently serving his second term in Congress, representing Texas's 21st Congressional District. He previously served as first Assistant Attorney General of Texas under Ken Paxton as Chief of Staff for Senator Ted Cruz. He was a senior advisor for Governor Rick Perry and Senator, Senate Judiciary Committee Staff Director under Senator John Corrin, as well as a federal prosecutor. So a lot of experience dealing both with uh, the particularities of Texas and the border, and as well as uh, in Congress. And prior to the public sector service he has done, he served uh, as an investment banking analyst. Congressman Roy, welcome. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, great to be with y'all, and uh, really appreciate uh, what y'all do at the uh, at the center. You, do such an important role. And uh, the border obviously is front and center. They're on the front lines of what we need to do to secure our nation. So glad to join you all. Thank you. Congressman, you have been uh, very vocal about the responsibility that the Biden administration bears for failing to secure the border. You told Fox News in August, quote, over the past several months, President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas have blatantly and consistently refused to do their constitutional duty to take care that the immigration laws be faithfully executed as required by Article 2, endangering countless Americans and foreign lives in the process. I think that assessment is accurate. So the question that I would bring to you is, uh, what are uh, our options? What, what's genuinely available to us to hold the Biden administration accountable for this border crisis? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's important for everybody to understand uh, the clarity of the Constitution and the law with respect to the duties that are required of our leaders to secure our nation, right? Uh, we have a Department of Homeland Security. We can debate whether we should or shouldn't or whether we should still have this under the AG or certain components under the Department of Defense. But we have these entities for a reason. And the President of the United States, the Secretary of Homeland Security, are obligated to enforce the laws of the United States. Go back to Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution and the guarantee that we have a Republican form of government and that the federal government, right, will protect us from invasion. Uh, that's an important part. And let's go further. Let's go look at the laws that exist, right, the laws on the books. I'm not going to go through them all because we don't have the time. But we've got numerous laws on the books that require the Secretary of Homeland Security and our officials to secure the border. The Secure Fence Act, for example, of 2000, whatever it was, five or six, whenever that was passed, <clears throat> that law requires that we have operational control of the border. Okay, that, that's a term, it's important, and it's a defined term. It requires that we build fence and infrastructure. Uh, there are laws on the books that require our officials to 
when we intercept individuals who are here illegally to then put them in removal proceedings and remove them from the United States absent a claim for asylum. And if they make it a claim for asylum, then there are very specific procedures they're supposed to follow to then adjudicate that claim and determine whether or not they have credible fear to be in the United States, et cetera. Now I'm glossing over a lot of those provisions, but then you need to have the uh, internal enforcement, ICE. You need to have proceedings to remove individuals. These are all requirements. They're not suggestions. Obviously, I'm a former federal prosecutor. There is prosecutorial discretion in all aspects of how we do law enforcement or enforcement of our border security laws in the United States. But you don't have discretion to not do it, okay? You have discretion to make a determination about a particular individual based on the merits of a claim that that individual makes. Now, I don't mean to dwell on this too long, but it's a really important foundation for anyone to understand why this administration is utterly failing. They have myriad tools at their disposal, myriad laws that require them to act, and are simply failing to use those. And I'll, I'll end this early diatribe and, and filibuster by saying, they've got tools that the previous administration had uh, built and put in place in response to the 2018 rush to our border. Now, it's important to know that that rush in 2018 was not unprecedented, but it was different, okay? And it was different in that it was mainly Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, uh, individuals, family units, unaccompanied alien children that were coming to the United States and seeking to claim asylum and use our asylum laws as a backdoor to get into the United States. Not because they had justifiable, for the most part, claims to asylum, but because they knew if they rushed our system and flooded the zone, they could grant, they could get access if we didn't actually enforce the law. So when you have that many numbers, you got to do something about it. Well, President Trump and his administration did something about it. Uh, they put in place uh, migrant protection protocols, the Return to Mexico program, where they interacted with Mexico, used the trade uh, pressure and negotiations to get Mexico to the table and work with us to require individuals to stay in Mexico, a safe third country, while awaiting the adjudication of an asylum claim. Well, guess what? That shuts the flow down because migrants don't think, oh, I can just come to the United States and just get to call, come on in. The second thing they did was Title 42. During a global pandemic, the use of existing laws, Title 42 uh, enables its decades old law uh, under our health codes uh, that allow us to say during a global pandemic, you we can just stop people and turn them away at the border for our health and national security. Between Title 42 and MPP, we shut the flow way down. We didn't close it. I mean, it was still needed work to be done, but we had that flow down to a manageable number of 20, 30,000 type a month numbers instead of the now 200,000 ish a month numbers of just apprehensions. I'm not talking about gotaways. And I'm happy to talk about that more, but I've, I've gone too long on your first question. Well, I mean, you, you flowed right into to my second question, which is we, you know, we have testimonials from migrants that the remain in Mexico policy was effective and that it played a significant role in their decisions not to cross during the Trump administration years. We also have testimony from them that they made a deliberate decision to come during the Biden administration because they felt, uh, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, that they had essentially received something of an invitation. Um, I mean, what do you think is the motivation for the Biden administration's intransigence when it comes to border security? Uh, I mean, and I think intransigence is the right word because, as you said, they are deliberately removing uh, policies that are in place that were working. Yeah, well, so we've talked about the structure of what is required and what works. We've showed how the Trump administration responded to a crisis and was able to stem the tide and uh, not fully, but at least responsibly respond at our border. Um, let's talk just for a minute about what's actually happening, right? We're now probably, when we get the September numbers, we're going to be well over one and a half million, probably pushing 1.6 or 7 million apprehensions for the year. Now, that is an extraordinary number, okay? That dwarfs numbers we've seen in the past. Over 200,000 a month through this summer. Normally, numbers start dropping off in the summer. We've had probably three to 400,000 gotaways. We've got uh, an extraordinary number of migrants who are dying in the South Texas 
heat in, on people's ranches. Um, Brooks County, Texas, for example, has had over 100 dead bodies found. Um, each one of those, they, that county has to pay $3,000 a person for an autopsy, $5,000 a person to bury them if their body's not clean. Ranchers have to deal with finding dead bodies on their ranches. Um, there's a body trailer that Sh the Sheriff Benny Martinez uh, is telling me about being used in Brooks County because of dead migrants. We've got people being put into the sex trafficking trade, getting put in stash houses across our country, being held for ransom and powering cartels, dangerous cartels that are making hundreds of millions of dollars moving human beings and fentanyl for profit. Fentanyl is killing Americans. 100,000 opioid either overdoses or poisonings in the last year. Compare that to, to the cocaine problem in the 80s when we had 10,000 people overdosing. We're at extraordinary unseen numbers, a hockey stick increase, and it is driven by cartels, driven by China, being perpetuated by an administration that refuses to actually secure the border. Now you ask why? Um, the answer is pretty simple. Crass politics. This administration, Democrats currently in power, could give a rat's rear end about the actual well-being of the American citizens or the migrants who seek to come here. In the false name of compassion, they say open borders are good for migrants. They're lying as evidenced by the dead migrants, as evidenced by the girls that get raped in the middle of the, the de desert in South Texas or in Southwestern United States, as evidenced by the girls put into the sex trafficking trade, as evidenced by the people dying from opioid overdoses and poisonings, like I said. And let me pause for one second here for anybody listening to this. I said this on uh, a recent uh, interview that I that I did, where I, I think it was on Stuart Varney, and, and I, I pointed out, I said, look, everybody watching this, okay, if you're a business person, if you're engaged in law, if you're engaged in policy, stop what you're doing. Someone you love, someone you know, someone that's a friend of yours is going to either him or herself or have his child die sometime soon from fentanyl because that individual is going to take what they believe to be a Xanax or Adderall, or they're gonna just, somebody's gonna smoke a, a joint laced with fentanyl purposely by cartels, or because of shoddy manufacturing where they, they're, they're creating a black market form of say Xanax, they cook it in the same pot, that they have fentanyl, then these individuals take that pill and they die from poisoning for a dangerous, dangerous substance of fentanyl. So this is happening in real time. And the Democrat administration, they don't care because all they care about is playing identity politics, advancing critical race theory, trying to divide us by race, trying to promote the idea that they're the ones who care for brown people. And only they, in their infinite wisdom as Democrats, are they the ones who can take care or be friends with or be compassionate for brown people. Tell you what, go talk to the brown people in South Texas who are getting pretty pissed off about having their families endangered, their communities overrun, our, our, our border not being protected and secured, and cartels empowered. And then you tell me who's looking out and caring uh, for American citizens, regardless of the color of their skin. I think you raise a really important point in, in painting the, the accurate picture of the, of the human cost on both sides of the border that, that we have because of the open flow. I remember when I was down in Del Rio, Texas in June and Congressman Joe Frank, Mar or Sheriff Joe Frank Martinez down there told us that the cartel on the other side of the border made $25 million a week because every single migrant who crosses pays the cartel for the privilege to do so. Yep. You know, in the absence of this clear federal leadership at, uh, gap, you know, there's no federal leadership here I mean, my question would be, how do we articulate the constitutional right of states to defend the border, to secure their border? Uh, we know that this right exists. You've been very vocal about this. Uh, how can we best make the case that states like Texas have to take the lead here? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I think it's actually the, the $64,000 question, although that dates me by quoting that number. Uh, but uh, here's here's the thing we want to take in, in order. Number one, uh, what Secretary Mayorkas and President Biden are doing uh, are, in my opinion, and I believe in the opinion of others that I'm continually talking to, impeachable acts. And Secretary Mayorkas ought to be impeached and President Biden ought to be impeached for purposely and willfully refusing to faithfully execute the laws of the United States and uh, frankly abusing their power by not doing so. They have a duty to faithfully execute the laws of the United States. They 
swore an oath to uphold the Constitution and defend our laws, and they are failing to do so. I outlined at the outset of this conversation the kinds of laws that are in place, the constitutional duty to actually secure the border. And when you're willfully withholding resources, when you are purposely not following the Secure Fence Act, not building the wall, not building the fencing and infrastructure needed, not helping and supporting Border Patrol, purposely creating policies to release individuals to the United States under parole or under notice to appear or notice to report, knowing they're not returning, not enforcing it internally, putting out memoranda saying don't enforce it, creating a magnet and a big neon sign saying come to the United States, claim asylum, and you're going to get to come in. Wink, wink. Don't worry. You'll be able to come in. Now you're causing a flood to our border. That is faith, That is failing to faithfully execute the laws of the United States. That is clearly impeachable, in my opinion, based on what the founders meant under impeachment and what your duty is to not break trust with the American people, not break the public trust and to carry out your constitutional duties. We can debate that, but that's my reading of it. And I believe we ought to impeach my orcas and we ought to impeach President Biden because of this. Now, what does that mean? As a result, if we know that the president and we know the secretary are not going to enforce the laws, if we know that therefore the people of Texas, the people of the United States are endangered because of the flow of drugs, narcotics, fentanyl, et cetera, into our communities, our children are dying in schools, if we know migrants are being abused, if we know ranches are getting overrun, fences getting cut, livestock getting out, cartels getting empowered to the detriment of our national security, the empowerment of China to move dangerous synthetics in through our southwest border. If all of those things are true, and they are, then it is incumbent upon a people in a state such as Texas to make a determination for themselves that they need to secure their own communities. I've been encouraging Governor Abbott, and look, let me let me stop and give credit where credit is due. In the Del Rio situation with the Haitian crisis a month ago, the governor sent massive resources, DPS resources, to Del Rio to support Border Patrol because this administration is not supporting Border Patrol. They're calling them racists and saying that they're using the reins of their horses as whips, blatant lies, by the way. And Texas is sending DPS law enforcement to go support them, and we did, and it helped. And Governor Abbott should be applauded for that. Uh, but my view is we need to go further. It is incumbent upon us to secure the border of Texas. That is constitutional. We have a right to defend ourselves in the absence of the federal government doing so. I understand that gives people a little bit of uh, trepidation. Uh, wait, that's a federal responsibility. Well, what happens if we have a conflict here and the state of Texas saying we should do it and the feds are saying don't? Look. Those questions get brought to bear and you can go litigate them if you want. But when you have a baby on your doorstep, you don't go seek a legal opinion about whether or not you can take the baby in. You take the baby in, you take care of the baby, then you go figure out all of the child protective whatever's and the adoption and the fostering and whatever. You, In this case, you don't sit back. If you're sitting on your ranch in 1870s Texas and the Comanches are riding down on your ranch, you don't go, well, I wonder what my rights are here. Who do I need to call? Do I need to go to a judge and find out what I'm able to do? No, you defend yourself. You defend your family. You protect your community. And that's where we are today. People in Texas, uh, across Texas, we need to defend our communities, secure the border, hold the line, and frankly, put a little tension with the feds and call their bluff. I don't believe that Joe Biden or federal authorities have the gumption to try to come into Texas and tell us we can't secure Texas. Well, on the plus side, as you mentioned, that history of Texas, there's actually some pretty decent case law uh, of Texas dealing with, with cross-border challenges in the past. So this is not entirely a new uh, challenge. But one of the questions that I had was, how can we, not every state is Texas, uh, not every state is a border state, but as we've increasingly seen uh, every state is being impacted by the flow of migrants. You know, uh, we have the federal government busing and planing uh, people into states from New York to, you know, Minnesota and everywhere in between. How can those states help support Texas uh, if Texas is is determined to to defend this border? Well, first of all, if you're a state that has a strong governor or you're a good uh, uh, good legislature, you do like Governor Ron DeSantis. And you can send resources to Texas, you can send resources to border states because you know not only are you helping your brothers and sisters who are dealing with it on the front lines, you're also supporting your own citizens by ensuring that we're doing what the federal government won't do. 
So encourage your governors, encourage your states to support Texas, to support Arizona, to some degree, I guess, support New Mexico and California, but I'm not sure they've got the leadership in place to do what needs to be done. Um, importantly, make sure that you talk about this. Look, the opioid issue, the narcotics, the fentanyl problem, that is not a problem limited to Texas. That is a nationwide problem. Those 100,000 deaths, you know, I met with a woman uh, who runs an organization uh, to, that, that tries to uh, help people and know to get uh, uh, people to understand and know what's happening with the fentanyl crisis. Um, and uh, Virginia, and I'm blanking on her last name, Virginia is a wonderful woman, and she, her daughter unfortunately passed away from a fentanyl uh, uh, poisoning. And it, she didn't know that what she was taking, again, it was something like a Xanax or something, she didn't know that it was laced with fentanyl and she died. And so this organization highlights, and I've got sheets of paper with the faces of the thousands of young Americans, not always just young, but the heavily young Americans who have died because of this scourge. The American people need to know that, okay? You need to talk about it in your communities. You need to talk about it with kids. You need to talk about it with your schools and your school boards. Be careful, you might be called a domestic terrorist, but we can talk about that a different day. But you need to go talk to your school boards, your communities, your churches, your church groups. Don't just sit back and just let this unfold. Don't just go to the, you know, you know, get up in the morning and watch college game day and then flip it on and watch the college football and then go to, the, you know, play golf with your buddies or go, you know, do whatever. And then don't you know, talk about this. Focus on it. Right. Uh, this is a problem nationwide and it's all tied back to the border. That's how we best do this is uh, you got to start locally. Don't look to Washington to solve the problem because it rarely solves any problem. It just creates problems. One of the things the Center for Security Policy has been doing is bringing resource to state legislatures about the danger of fentanyl, uh, in particular evidence that suggests that fentanyl can be considered a weapon of mass destruction uh, under existing laws. So we're very, very much in agreement with you that, that local and state efforts uh, are where the action really is right now. But let's say uh, in 2022, uh, the Republicans have a good election year. They retake the midterms. Um, is there anything that Congress can do to better facilitate states taking an active role at the border, uh, realizing that we, we still will have a Biden administration until at least 2024? Well, the main thing, the single main thing that I try to remind everybody that we need to make sure happens uh, with a Congress, preferably a Republican run Congress, is to um, stop funding a government that is doing the things that is undermining and endangering us. Just stop it. If there's any religion that Republicans, conservatives, any remotely well meaning Democrats, like my friend Henry Cuellar, and a few others, have any interest in trying to save this country, stop printing money. Stop borrowing money in order to fund organizations, or I should say bureaucrats and agencies that are taking away your liberty, targeting you, and failing to do your one core function as a government, which is to secure the blessings of liberty and to secure this country. Stop funding it. Let me give you an example. And this will be interesting for you guys, given you know the focus across the issues, not just border security, but security generally. The National Defense Authorization Act, which was just passed through uh, the House a few weeks ago, passed through the Senate, it's in conference, they're deliberating it, they wanna get it out, get it out of conference committee, get it cleared out of both houses. It was passed with overwhelming majorities. Now, there was a large block of Republicans that voted no, but two thirds of the Republicans in the House of Representatives voted for the bill. Now, we all support defense. We all support it. Everyone at your organization, and I know many of them, support ensuring that our men and women in uniform have the tools they need. We have a clear mission. We go fight China. We go recognize that we need to deal with space. We need to deal with that frontier, what we just saw with the, the uh, you know, low orbit missile that China fired. Uh, we know we need to stand strong, stand along Israel. We need a strong military working with Israel and holding the line in the Middle East with the right policies. We gotta clean up the mess that, that the Biden administration just left. All of that takes resources but we gotta have guns and butter conversations. We gotta have conversations about what we're empowering DOD to do and don't just give them a blank check without holding them to account to do what we want them to do, right? Don't give them an additional $25 billion and not have accountability of Millie or Austin. 
Don't give them money to go run climate change preaching in the Department of Defense, which they're doing right now, doing indoctrination of climate change to all of our members, the men and women in uniform. Don't allow them to have you know, chief diversity officers promoting critical race theory throughout the Department of Defense. Okay, that's one example. Two thirds of Republicans just voted for that garbage. Also, by the way, gun grabbing, red flag bills and drafting our daughters. Put all that aside, talk about the border, don't fund it. Don't fund the Department of Homeland Security that doesn't fix our asylum laws, that doesn't fix TVPRA, which is the thing about unaccompanied children, or the Flores Settlement, which is catch and release. Fix those things, fix our laws, Enforce Title 42, enforce Migrant Protection Protocol, build the fence. Don't fund government that doesn't do those things. That's the simple solution if you want to fix this stuff. I mean, I think that's uh, that's exactly right. And I would uh, encourage people to check out um, the, the rest of the, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, I know you have a number of issues with it, all of which are very much worth addressing. I wish we had time to get into some of them, but people should take a, a good look at that uh, because often I think too much of the security policy conversation is if we throw money at something that will that will solve our problem rather than actually looking at how that money is is spent. Uh, I wanted to briefly ask you about a bill you filed in February of last year, the Border Visibility and Security Act, and it seems like a pretty straightforward piece of legislation. It has to do with eliminating overgrowth vegetation, uh, which obstructs border patrol visibility and helping to build some ro roads. Is that is that something that can get a quick and easy bipartisan support? And, and if not, why not? Well, it's a good question. And, and if you see my eyes, I've heard off the screen every once in a while because I'm watching the floor vote. They're gonna call votes uh, at some point here. Um, that bill that you mentioned was a bill that Henry Cuellar, my friend from Texas, and he is a friend, he's a good man. Um, and he and I uh, meet often, and we've met uh, together in South Texas. We met, met together at Laredo, where he represents. And that came about based on our conversation that, well, there's some disagreement uh, among Democrats and um, a few Republicans, although less so now, about the fence and about the wall. Now, I'm a strong proponent of the need for a uh, tall fence, a wall from basically the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Big Bend, you know, then, you know, police Big Bend how you can and then keep moving on up to El Paso. Uh, you can have spaces there for ranchers to get access to the Rio Grande. You can put up cameras. But the main thing you need in addition to that is you need roadways for Border Patrol to move along the, the Rio Grande and to actually police the border, a border increasingly operated and controlled by terrorists, essentially cartels. Now, I know that's be a controversial position if you call cartels terrorists. We can have that conversation another day, but they are effectively like terrorists in terms of what they're doing to the United States and manipulating our, our, our laws and our security and well-being. Why do we need this, road, this, this bill? Well, if we can clear the cane, clear the view, and have a road that parallels the Rio Grande, uh, now you've got the ability for Border Patrol to move up and down the river laterally. Currently in Laredo, for example, you have about a, it depends on how you look at it, but about a 75 mile as a crow flies stretch, 125 miles of net, you know, windy Rio Grande River, where they have three, three miles of all of that is navigable by a permanent weather, all weather, you know, good, good road, and about 10 miles of hodgepodge navigable road, and the rest is just ranch land, hills, cane, scruff, rocks, difficult terrain. I know because I've driven it with Border Patrol a lot. So you imagine going down and you're sitting there 11 o'clock at night, your cell signal is terrible. You don't have a two way radio that works. You only have one border patrol agent in the car because we've been beating the crap out of them and Biden has beat down their morale and we have fewer numbers. The rest of them are down processing people down at McAllen. You've got one guy trying to patrol a three to five to 10 mile stretch and you can't even move along the river in parallel. You get a call that there's some migrants coming across four miles up. You gotta come up, get on a highway, go this way, go through the city, go through a gate, open the gate, go into somebody's ranch land, then come out and go over and go try to find them. I mean, they're off in the dark now because the cartels know where to put them. So this is happening every single day. We need to have common sense changes at our border. This is one of those. Um, it's hung up right now because Democrats don't want to do anything to secure the border, like literally nothing. But if we get back in, in power, I hope it's something that we can move through in addition to or alongside what we do with the fencing. 
Are there other common sense fixes at the border that you would like to see a, a Republican Congress move forward uh, if that should happen? Yeah, you know, the irony of all this is that there are some issues we deal with that are complex and difficult to figure out. You know, what our president should be and how long it should be and where it should be in the Middle East. Have a long conversation with your great staff and team about that, right? I mean, because there's some complex variables. How to handle China, uh, what we should do with respect to some of our healthcare policies get pretty complex and patent laws and, health, and what you do with medicines. This is not complex, okay? This is simple. You want to secure the border of the United States. You build the physical barrier to stop the immediate danger of the flow. Do that right now. We have it funded. The president is refusing to do it. We have fence parts stacking up and rusting in the middle of Texas. Easy solution ought to be done. Two, clear the cane, build roads, et cetera. That's bipartisan. Do that. Make it to where Border Patrol can move up and down the river. Three, fix our asylum laws. Clear up what credible fear is. Make it to where it's very clear that if you're going to claim asylum, you're going to claim it somewhere else from a safe third country, claim it in Mexico, and then we'll adjudicate it, make a decision whether you come in. Uh, there'll be some rare circumstances where if you're truly in fear of your life of persecution, you're sitting in Mexico and you need to come to the United States, we can figure out how to house you while you adjudicate it or adjudicate it quickly. But 90 plus percent of asylum claims are not granted asylum. So clear up asylum laws, clear up uh, what we call our, our the Flores settlement and the catch and release laws. Heck, the, even the Obama administration had law, had a text for, for a reform of the law to change that. You could fit on one piece of paper. Uh, same thing with TVPRA, which is about being able to return unaccompanied children and flying them home. If you fix all of those and you give proper resources to Border Patrol and ICE, then you solve the problem. You have a secure border. You have to have strong interior enforcement to deal with visa overstays. Once you've established that, you look, if you were just, if we were czar and we just made a decision, we could fix this and secure this border in weeks, literally weeks. And then with however much time it takes to build out the fence, now you're really secure. Then you have a conversation about future flow, immigration reforms, making sure we've got the proper high-tech visas and everything else and figure out how we, we allow a million plus people to come into the United States every year. Let's clean that up and let's fix it. Then you can have a conversation about what to do with anybody who came here illegally in the past, but it has to be sequential and border security has to come first. Okay, I know we're a little short on time uh, because of the vote. I'd like to bring Adam back on to see if we can't get some audience questions um, while we have you. Adam, is that possible? Absolutely. Um, one moment. Do you think alienated American minorities and Hispanics in particular will continue to lean red due to the stresses of illegal immigration? Well, let me give you a couple of data points. Number one, the in McAllen, Texas, we just had a Republican elected for the first time in I don't know how long, but a very long time, uh, due to the building and continued frustration that many uh, individuals, particularly Hispanic, <clears throat> have who live in the Rio Grande Valley along the border with Mexico, watching cartels run rampant, endangering them and their families, endangering our communities, uh, moving fentanyl, moving human beings for profit. Uh, they're tired of it, and they're tired of the lip service from Democrats who want to be the ones who pretend that only they, in their infinite wisdom, know what's good for brown people, and that's what they'll say. Uh, go down and do as I did with Senator Cruz a few weeks ago and sit down with the leadership of Webb County in Laredo, Texas, and talk to folks uh, who are lifelong Hispanic Democrats who are now saying, I don't know what in the world, but I'm done with this. I, where is Biden? Why isn't he here? Why does he take us for granted? Why isn't he securing the border, right? These are lifelong Hispanic Democrats. Zapata County, Texas, last November, went for a Republican for the first time since 1920 when they voted for Donald Trump. Uh, trust me, I just drove through Zapata County a month ago with Senator Cruz en, en route to Roma to meet with ranchers. There was a certain flag flying in, in Zapata that I can't say here, uh, but you can imagine what it says and it, it's, it rhymes with let's go Brandon. Uh, and uh, so look, there's a lot of frustration there's a lot of frustration in South Texas, um, and I think people are starting to figure out the joke. Um, I just sat on a panel, slightly different topic, but it's relevant. I just sat on a panel with Secretary Ben Carson, right, pretty much a genius, and, uh, and, 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 and several other folks, uh, all of whom happen to be black. I don't even like talking about skin color. It's not how I was raised, but we were talking about all of the uh, issues with critical race theory. 
right? And people playing this hand, trying to div divvy us up by race, which uh, Chief Justice Roberts referred to as a sordid business. You might remember in a Supreme Court case a decade ago. It is a sordid business. Democrats profit in that business. Uh, leftists profit in that business. And we're trying to break that down and make sure that we're standing up for, for uh, all people, regardless of their color, and have a secure United States. Uh, there's a question, what can Californians do since there's a Dem, Dem governor and a Dem supermajority? And I would add to that, we hear so much about Texas. Is there still a big flow over the California border? Uh, a flow from California to Texas? No, 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 I'm sorry, over the Mexican border into California. Uh, yes, it is a little less uh, interesting, and I don't have the data right in front of me, but if I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dust off the memory banks. If you go back to 1995, we put in triple layer fencing across South, Southern California. The numbers of the mid 1990s, we had kind of a surge of, of, uh, of folks in the 90s, and we were dealing with that problem. And uh, as a Clinton administration in there, and we actually reacted to it appropriately, trying to stop it. It had triple layer fencing, and it went from something like, I don't know, half a million people coming across at one time to about 50,000. Had a material impact and dropped the numbers. Now, we still have a significant flow. We have tunneling, we have people coming around, we have some gaps in the fencing. We have people that, uh, you know, come through and, and, and uh, you know, look, we, Senator Cruz and I were sitting in a scan uh, center at the checkpoint, and we, there, a truck came through with uh, 29 illegal immigrants stacked in the back of it. We can see through an x-ray, like that happens all the time. So there still is a significant flow in Southern California. Uh, there is in Arizona, in fact, Yuma is getting a major flood right now. Uh, but nothing like the numbers we're seeing in Texas, right? That was just where it was directed towards in McAllen, uh, Laredo, but McAllen in particular, where we've had these massive waves of, of family members coming uh, up through Texas. Uh, there's a question about cartels in China buying U.S. land along the U uh, U.S. land along the U.S.-Mexico border, and, and what maybe speaks to China's involvement, if any, overall. Yeah, well, you know, China uh, is evil, and we need to beat China. It's that simple, and we need a clear uh, mission, directive, and effort to do so. Um, this this missile uh, test is no surprise, but it is um, uh, but it is something that we need to take seriously. We need to focus on, and uh, and we need to recognize what China's doing every single day, uh, whether it's espionage, whether it's uh, cyber security, cyber attacks, whether it's purposely targeting Mexico and driving fentanyl and, and synthetic opioids up through our border into the United States purposely uh, to undermine us, to provide dollars to cartels that will then be beholden to China, can then you know leverage those relationships, and frankly, then destroying a uh, what was building into a growing strength in the Western Hemisphere, which we have failed to develop as we should have post, um, uh, well, now USMCA, but NAFTA before, uh, to build a really robust, strong Western Hemisphere economy to compete with China. Uh, if you ask me something that Republicans ought to be running on in 2022, 2024, and beyond, it's to have a massive new Western Hemisphere effort. You know, call it the fill-in-the-blank doctrine, whoever's going to propose it. Uh, but we need to have a massive effort to have a strong, robust economy and to build out economies, the rule of law, and stability throughout the Western Hemisphere to beat the hell out of China. Okay, and I think we need to do it, and we need to go on offense, and it needs to be a coordinated effort. You don't you secure our border not because we're trying to isolate. You secure our border for the rule of law. You secure our border because it matters. Because what sets us apart as a country is the rule of law, and we want to export the rule of law rather than importing lawlessness. And that's what we're doing. A uh, question about the uh, the way that uh, that. Uh, Migrants are being flown to different areas of the country. Could they be being uh, flown to swing districts? And given the mail-in ballots, um, uh, could this actually swing elections almost immediately? Well, you know, all of that gets into things that are not fully provable by, by me sitting here, except that everything the left does is purposeful, strategic. I'm, I'm going to see tomorrow my friend Molly Hemingway, who had her book come out recently, Rigged, where in, in which she posits basically that this was less about you know, an illegally stolen election as much as a Democrats using all of the powers and tools that they can to basically just take the election, right? Whether it's Zuckerberg dumping dollars, including in San Marcos, Texas, a district I represent, uh, all over the nation, uh, a purposeful effort. The, don't kid yourselves. The open border is part of that. They believe they can import people, import numbers, try to shift, flip Texas, distribute people throughout the United States, 
and believe that they can win people over. That's why they did this and they saw all the t-shirts that were coming here with Biden t-shirts uh, heading up through Central uh, America, Mexico, into the United States. Uh, it's purposeful. I hope it backfires. We need to secure the border. We need to take control and ownership over this. But I hope it backfires in that they um, uh, believe they own Hispanic voters and Hispanic voters ought to be offended by that, whether they came to the United States five minutes ago or came to the United States you know, 50 years ago. They ought to be just literally uh, offended by the way in which uh, the left in this country assume that it is they who have an ownership over people because of the color of their skin. They are the modern day uh, 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 plantation owners, if you will. Again, Adam, several more if I may jump in with one quick question. Uh, your, your comments about Latin America, Congressman, made, made me think of um, Vice President Kamala Harris's recent trip uh, down to Guatemala, uh, and the the administration has pushed this argument about root causes in Latin America uh, leading to uh, immigration and claimed that they are going to fix the root causes uh, in Latin America. Could you comment briefly on, on this administration's approach to Latin America? Well, if any of us knew what it was, if there was any seriousness of, of, of uh, resolve to actually do something like I was trying to describe a moment ago, and that we ought to have longer and bigger and deeper conversations as Republicans or, or, or in the case of, of a nonpartisan entity, conservatives or people who just want to have a secure, vibrant Western hemisphere, let's have those conversations. Look, and if the, if the vice president or the president or anybody in this administration were remotely serious about sitting down and figuring that out, great, I'll be happy to join them. Uh, but what they're doing is using that to obfuscate away from actually securing the board. Hey, I went down to Central America and I said, don't come. Let's work together to secure. Then they take every step possible to continue the flood of people coming to the United States, causing a labor and brain drain from the countries in question, undermining the stability of El Salvador, undermining the stability of Honduras, undermining the stability of Guatemala, undermining the stability of Mexico purposely. And instead, so we, I remember it was the first lady of I don't know if it was Honduras or El Salvador. The first lady was here in the United States last year, and she was saying, I, we're getting killed. It's hurting our country with, with these policies and these cartels that are shoving all these people up to the United States, and we ought to do something about that. And, and that's not what we're hearing out of this administration. They're giving lip service to something, talking about root causes, and then they go around and talk about climate change. Climate change. You can't make this crap up. It's like, oh, we're going to go talk about critical race theory and climate change. We're going to talk about you know, all they ever talk about are those issues, and none of them have any seriousness of resolve how to develop a strong, workable, fully vibrant Western Hemisphere um, economy. Adam? Sure. Uh, so there, there continue to be questions here about what the states can do, but um, how about specifically can a, a governor build a wall on, a, on his own and confiscate the materials that are already dedicated? Well, on the first part of the question, you know, of course, a governor can build a wall if it's not on federal land, if it's on private ranches and the private ranchers agree and give them that property, or if the state exercises eminent domain under state police power to build a wall and build infrastructure. Uh, the state of Texas is working on that. We've got private contributions for dollars. We've got state dollars set aside, I think almost a billion, to be able to go work and, and continue construction of the wall in the absence of of the federal government being willing to do it. I don't think we can go just take those resources, right? Those are federal, uh, you know, assets, if you will, big chunks of metal or whatever sitting there. Now, if they're just gonna go to waste, they're gonna be scrapped, can we get them? I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's actually a good question. I think I might ought to, we ought to look into that, guys, about what can we do to go get those fence uh, pieces if they're just gonna let them sit there and rust. But, you know, Bottom line is, I think we need to have um, states just stepping up and fighting, right? You don't need to sit back and go, well, there was that Arizona decision uh, nine years ago, or whatever it was, 2013, whatever it was. Uh, and, and you know, uh, they said, that, you know, we can't enforce federal law. Like, Wait, hold on a second. First of all, we have a different court. Second of all, go read Scalia and the, and the uh, minority, you know, the dissenting views in the, um, in the case. And those dissenting views were quite strong. Uh, it didn't say that all powers were gone. I think there are uh, there's still a lot of room under the Constitution to revisit that, and states need to just frankly just step up under their sovereign power as a state to say we're going to secure the communities in which we live, period. Since the courts have ordered the Remain in Mexico policy to be reinstated, when will this happen? I have not seen any action on this. 
Yeah, it won't happen. Uh, what's going to happen is the Biden administration is saying that they're going to do it in November. They put out some statement uh, last week saying, we're doing it. We're going to go do it. We'll start in November. Meanwhile, they're issuing memoranda saying that they're going to go find ways to issue the memoranda to undo the migrant protection protocol using the proper procedures under the Administrative Procedures Act, which is what my friend and law school classmate at the University of Texas, Matt Kazmarek, uh, up in Amarillo in, in Texas, uh, when he issued the ruling saying, hey, Biden administration, you didn't follow the Administrative Procedures Act. You need to go back to migrant protection protocol and you need to issue me reports showing you are. They're taking steps to basically slow walk, delay, show him, oh, yeah, we're doing it a little bit. And don't worry, we're going to do it in November and we've got all these things. They have no intention of doing it. Now, if I'm proven wrong, great. Run this tape all day long showing that Chip Roy's an idiot. I don't mind. But I'm telling you, it's bogus. They have no intention of doing it. They're slow walking it. They have no intention of securing the border. And uh, we need Congress to act. And I might mention, I have a measure on the floor of the House of Representatives to discharge Title 42, uh, my friend Yvette Harrell's bill, in order to force a vote on the floor of the House. You need 218 signatures. We have 180. There are 31 Republicans who haven't signed that. If you, if you call your Congress man or woman and say, sign that discharge petition. The second one that was just filed this week is one that would require the migrant protection protocols to be used. My friend Andy Biggs and uh, Matt Rosendale, they filed uh, a measure to do that, which I signed yesterday uh, the first time I was able to do it. So uh, we ought to discharge those bills. I have no idea why Republican leadership won't do that other than that they run away from every significant fight. Can we put drones with night vision and re recording capacity for immediate and legal use? Um, I don't know what the limits are on drone usage or what we can or can't do. I mean, I'm in favor of very specific and tight use of drones at our border. I certainly don't want the United States government flying drones all over the United States looking at all of us. But when you're talking about what we're doing at the border, having drones uh, uh, manning and you know, doing what we need to do there, daytime, nighttime, it is happening. We use drones. Uh, we ought to have more of it. We need, we need fencing. We need drones. We need better communication. We need better uh, funded border patrol, and we don't need to be calling them racists who are going around whipping people when they're not, like Jen Psaki did lying at the lectern for the White House. Uh, and we ought to call her out as the liar that she is and call the president out for the liar that he is uh, and going after the very border patrol agents who report to him simply for doing the job he won't do. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, Congressman, are we seeing anything uh, with uh, border patrol numbers dropping off? I know morale is very low. There's also the federal vaccine mandate uh, for federal employees. Is that having an effect on U.S. Border Patrol morale and, and manpower numbers? Because, you know, the last question was about technology, but ultimately you need somebody to watch the drones. You need somebody to make the arrests. So, uh, yes, it's having a massive impact. Uh, I can tell you that Border Patrol morale has been going down, 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 and it was at a pretty good low. And then you have the president of the United States and, the, as I said, the press secretary and the secretary uh, going after Border Patrol agents for doing their job and saying that they're whipping people and morale dropped even further. We are losing people. I can't remember the exact numbers. I don't want to cite an incorrect number, but it is a significant number of, of uh, Border Patrol agents a week. We're not able to bring the inflow up to match the outflow. Those numbers are going down. Border Patrol agents are distracted processing people in McAllen because that's all they're doing is running diapers and processing stations. Uh, rather than actually securing the border, you've got large swaths of our border that are unpatrolled. Cartels know that. They exploit it. <clears throat> and now you throw on top of this the vaccine mandates, which are unconstitutional and unlawful as applied to private sector, uh, you know, requiring it on businesses. The president literally has no authority or power to do that. Uh, and now he's doing it on, uh, you know, the federal agencies, whether it's the Department of I actually do have to go vote. But let me just say... If you can hear me, all I was saying was the vaccine mandates will have a massive impact. That is having a massive impact. Uh, the president has no authority to do it in the private sector. He does to agents. I haven't studied that fully, but the, you, you, what, what pushback they could push back on religious exemptions and otherwise. But he shouldn't be doing this. It's absurd. Uh, we can have a whole other conversation on vaccine mandates and, and the you know impact that's having on our national security and well-being. I got to run to the floor to vote. I'm sorry to cut this short by about eight minutes, but. Um, look, I appreciate you all. I appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate everybody watching this. Uh, we need to go secure the United States. That's our fundamental duty in government and not uh, have the government uh, spending money we don't have to go clamp down on your rights as citizens. And I'm going to keep trying to do that. Congressman, thank you.
Well, that was Congressman uh, Chip Roy uh, on how to deal with the uh, U.S. southern border during the Biden era. Uh, we're very thankful for his office for, for making him available uh, for the time that he's had available. And we hope that you've enjoyed this. It will, uh, Adam, if you want to provide them with information about upcoming webinars. Sure. And I'm sorry for the small tech hiccups there. Um, next Monday, we have uh, next Monday, the 25th. Beyond Iron Dome, Charting Israel's Offensive Capabilities in the Context of a Nuclear Iran, be featuring two retired Israeli generals, Yosef Cooperwasser and Amir Avivi, moderated by the Center Senior Fellow, Eli Kohanim, and Director of Armina Program, Victoria Coates. Then we have on November 3rd, How to Stop Iran's Nuclear Program, uh, moderated by the Center President, Fred Flights, and we will be featuring three experts, David Albright, James Phillips, and David Wormser. We do thank you for being here today. Remember that the center's timely and insightful programs like this one are only possible because of your generous support. If you do enjoy these as much as I do, please visit our website at securefreedom.org. Click on the big white donate button in the upper right corner. You can make an instant contribution or get information about other methods of giving. Uh, thanks a lot. We will see you next Monday. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.